What did you hear, Randy? I hear something behind us. Where we came from. Like yeah. Back, back down the trail. Back this way, yeah. Over here. Sometimes I... the idea I want to get across. If you take a look at all of the beliefs surrounding Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, you name it, what you get is a scale. Now, over here on this side are the researchers who believe it's an ape. It's Gigantopithecus. Over here, you've got aliens. Once you get right into the middle of it, what you have is a battleground. And people are going at it like this the whole time. This group thinks that this side is off their rocker. This group thinks that this side is completely missing things. So there's the broad spectrum, this big scale, the scale that is Bigfoot. My job is not to say it's an alien or it's a Gigantopithecus. My job is to get people to bring me into these areas, to let me experience what they experience, to see what can happen, and to keep an open mind to all possibilities. You don't need those thousands of casted footprints to be real. You only actually need one of them to be real, to then say that the species exists at all, whatever it might be. I'm back on the west coast of Canada, looking for clues and hoping for answers. If they do exist, they can only have survived alongside our species without being killed off or dominated by being far more elusive than we can readily understand or are even willing to. But this possibility requires the mind to stretch beyond its accustomed conception of the forest and its inhabitants. And to do that, I'm gonna have to try some new methods. What seems to be happening a lot is I'm meeting up with people who come at it from a, a, a more spiritual angle. For them, it's about connecting with a a species that has a level of intellect, ability, spirituality that takes it to a different place. That's the thing, with all these inroads into the subject matter, whether it's purely biological, you know, searching for an ape that walks upright, or really on the other far side of things, figuring they're connected to the star people or the aliens, or somewhere down the middle where they're biological, but they're also spiritual and intelligent. It's an interesting way to look at the subject matter. Sonia Zohar and Randy Breeson are two Sasquatch advocates that don't give the matter a second thought. They don't struggle intellectually with the concept that this species may come with some kind of inherent spirituality, even possessing mental and physical abilities far beyond what mainstream science considers normal. But then, what's normal when it comes to Sasquatch? Or to ponder more deeply, what's normal, period? Randy, Sonia, and almost the entirety of the aboriginal perspective don't stop at Sasquatch being a big, upright, walking ape. They already know it's capable of a lot more than just throwing rocks and disappearing behind trees. Many so-called habituators, like Randy, attempt to talk to their Sasquatch visitors indirectly through objects. They start their attempts at connecting to Sasquatch not by leaving bait, but by giving gifts. And on many occasions, as it is with this twisted twig, they're left with gifts in return. With this gentle approach, it would seem that lessening potential exposure anxiety in whatever is out there will help to achieve communication. This is done by using small objects in digestible small doses. Can a purely instinctual animal communicate through gift exchanges? These are still images of Randy's. 
Over the years, he's documented hundreds of odd occurrences. Strangely twisted and decorated branches. Elk limbs left hanging in trees. Numerous tracks. And this face, this image peering out from behind a stump. You can add all these to the 10,000 other images collected from around the world. One day I was here, just like after two years of doing it, mm -hmm. slowly they come down, they go back up. They slowly come down, you know what I mean? They didn't trust me at first. And one day I'm right here, and I'm just about to walk up, and there's one there and two sitting over there. Even when Randy does leave out food, he prefers to make things difficult for known animals such as bears or raccoons. Jars of salmon are left in such a way that only hands can open. Sonia believes it's important to start leaving very intricate gifts, gifts that of all natural substances, uh, handmade crafts, things like that. And she's been doing that and they disappear. What out in the wilderness takes away a trinket. Well, squirrels do. Tracking is all about noticing subtle changes in the environment and then ruling out the probable causes, and that includes humans. So here's, you know, what you might want to call a tree break, except you can clearly see the axe marks. There's so much pop culture surrounding the subject of Bigfoot to get this this joke effect, you get teenagers and people doing hoaxes. Now that they hear about tree breaks and structures, you're going to probably have all kinds of hoax tree breaks all over the place, wherever the public can easily get to, and uh, lining them up and, you know, in an attempt to freak out girlfriends and things like that, you know? So why not try my own hoax, make my own set of tracks in an attempt to trick the experts? Well, to do that, I'll need to go to the experts, special effects designers, in Hollywood, California. I was surprised to learn that acquiring a Bigfoot suit is easier than I thought. Matt and Roy at Soda Productions, one of the best in the business, explained to me that there have been dozens of B-movies made about Bigfoot in Hollywood. And all of those expensively custom-designed suits are still in existence. And you can rent them for 50 bucks. I'm out to say, how difficult or easy is it to pull off a hoax now? Any kind of effects company, effects shop, worth its salt, we've all done a Bigfoot or an ape. There's so many out there. They're full scale, they're eight feet tall, and they're completely self-contained. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is, is to get somebody out there in one of these things, it's horrible. Yeah. It's a horrible condition. Huh. You know, I mean, you're sitting there in like two inches of foam with, with hair on you, I and mean, you're going to drop dead. OK, so hoaxing takes some serious effort. And I have no interest in hanging around campgrounds in a claustrophobic suit custom made at a cost of over 50,000 bucks. But track making is another matter. And Roy and Matt send me home with a set of my very own Sasquatch boots. Better thing to do here would be to try and get seven foot strides so I can show the strides. There's just no way I can do a seven foot stride carrying all this weight on my feet and uh, you know do a jump. I'm lucky to get three or four here, so. What I'll do is I'll, I'll walk along the lake, up over this dock, off that way. Whoa! Shows you, you gotta really put some thought into how to make something like this work. It's not so easy. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, you can just make some fake tracks. Oops, keeps falling off. Just to get to this stage has cost me over $1,000. Perpetrating a hoax is just not as easy as it sounds. Back in Ontario, I'm using my own set of Sasquatch boots to make fake tracks I can cast and take to Bigfoot researchers in an effort to see how easy it is or isn't to pull off a hoax. Okay, so that makes it look like I was trying to film the set of tracks that I found. If there's ever an issue with people who have claims of, of tracks and seeing Bigfoot, it's that if they have footage, 
you know, where's the before and after clips? Where's the messy footage? It's like in the Roger Patterson film, they never show the, the, the 30 seconds leading up to the Bigfoot. It's good to see what led up to something to establish the proof of it. I'm not attempting to ruin anyone's reputation or even make a mockery of the subject matter. What I want is to get to the answer to my question, which is, concerning all of the evidence of Sasquatch in existence today, how easy is it or isn't it to fake? At this point, my own tally is four full days of my time and over 3,000 bucks, including airfare. And I'm a long way from pulling off my hoax. The first set of tracks you guys gave me, um, I have some things to tell you about with that. I did them in the snow. And um, one track um, it kind of picked up the crystals in the snow. And then the other one got the toes really nicely. But now I'm coming to you guys, the pros, and saying, let's do this for real now. What I think we should do, you know, basically, we re-sculpt the foot in clay. And we'll go and we'll try to make the, the occipital ridges and stuff a little bit closer. We had talked about that, too. Mm -hmm. a, a big one is how to do the track set. And when I say that, I mean the actual distancing of the, of the walk. We don't have to put them on my feet. OK. So that might help. I'm or we sure. can make your legs longer. And then what I'd like to do this time, instead of make them out of fiberglass, is make them out of a really tough urethane. It'll only take Roy and Matt a day to make the next set of track makers. So I'll leave them to it. And I'll head back to Sonia and Randy in Western Canada. Sonia's connection to the natural world, including Sasquatch, is personal, spiritual, and intimate. She doesn't use trail cams, overhead drones, or heat sensor cameras. She has a highly tuned skill set that I have never acquired, that of meditation. After building her ceremonial spot in the middle of the forest with candles and feathers, she then asks me to have time alone for about an hour. It takes time to calm the soul and the spirit. And only once she feels right will she then invite me to take part in a pointed and focused period of meditation. Sonia and I are in the forest to practice some meditation. Now, it's not just basic, normal meditation for personal uh, benefit, although it is good for that. But it's also meditation focused on connecting to Bigfoot, whatever else is out here. So as you know, meditation is just a quieting, stilling of the mind. And the reason for that is this, you have a system in your body that never shuts down, which is your nervous system. So even while you sleep, um, you dream. So the idea of meditation is to quiet yourself into a position where that system in your body gets to relax. Um, but in this endeavor, what we want to do is quiet it down and still ourselves so that we can listen. Deep breath, and let it out with your mouth. Until now, I've considered my time in the forest to be meditation enough. But Sonia's methods are far more focused. To connect to the Sasquatch on their terms, it may be that instead of invasive trail cams and hooping in the dark or banging on trees, what's needed is to turn down my own volume give them a sense of grace and privacy, and approach them indirectly so as not to have them feel invaded. Randy and Sonia are close to the left side of the Sasquatch scale, rejecting categorically the Gigantopithecus or Big Ape theories. They feel that while trail cams make you feel proactive, they most often lead to nothing. Their method is to connect emotionally, spiritually, and energetically to the species called Sasquatch. And they have a point. No one has a single definitive, indisputable trail cam shot yet. And there are hundreds of thousands of them out there on trees right now. I'm willing to try anything on this road to first contact. OK, so here's the deal. I'm to stay in this tent alone and quiet, no lights on, everything turned off. And wait and listen, pay attention to the forest around me, become very alert to all the nuances of my surroundings. And to 
invoke basically that other side of Bigfoot research. I stay out here alone, wait patiently, and using my sheer energy, see what I can bring out. I'm in the mountains of Western Canada, attempting to elicit an interaction with whatever might be out in the forest that many people are calling Sasquatch. And I'm trying some new methods. Meditation is a way of connecting to the energies of the natural world. It's just as viable a research method as setting up trail cameras. And strangely enough, those that practice it seem to have a greater success at getting a response from whatever might be out in the woods than do those that are laying out trail cameras and DNA traps. As I search through the forest, I'm seeing again a familiar scene that I find unique, perplexing, and thought-provoking. Old cut stumps from logging days, covered with sticks and branches, that could not have just fallen on them naturally. So, what we're looking at here is, there's all these, you know, log trees from years and years ago, but every year, people leave the area, something moves in and covers these logs, these, these stumps with, uh, well, with this. What's really strange? is that I found this very same phenomenon in Southern Oregon and Northern California. They're not random fallen twigs. They're clearly placed on the stumps in an orderly fashion. At least one person has commented that it's like something or someone in the forest is lamenting the cutting of the trees and is paying homage to them or trying to cover them up like a spiritual bandage. This could easily be uh, teenagers making a, a fort, kids making a fort. Uh, even to the point where if they come, if the kids come back year after year, they add to it. Let's go up to our fort, Johnny. You know, and they go up until they're too old and they don't care anymore. Knowing the difference between kids making a fort and unexplainable structures in the forest is key. Attention must be paid to where these things happen, because so long as broken and bent trees and even massive human-like tracks are found where humans frequent, everything will be suspect. Who's doing it? That's intriguing. That becomes another better, more intriguing part of the puzzle because that's not the kind of thing that humans, teenagers, kids do. We don't do it like that. We, even when we're mucking about, we've got to leave things symmetrical and uh, lined up like we're building little houses. And the work is too extensive for little kids to do it and too consistent for teenagers to do it. Uh, and every parent out there knows exactly what I'm talking about. Our tendency is to model everything after our human minds. How would we survive in the forest? While searching for signs, Randy brings me to markings. And other than squirrels, I can't place them on any known animal. So we've got all of this pull down of the bark on these trees here. There's a tree about eight or nine feet. And this, Randy explains, is their markings. They've, they've stripped the bark off here. And as you go up the hill, about every 100 yards or so, the bark is stripped like that, all the way up, just up into the, up into the hills there. I'm just looking for tracks as I walk along. I think I found a track. Right here. Yeah. 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 You see? Like the right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not mine. Mine's right here. That's me. And then there's this guy right here. So it's like a right, a right foot, and I can feel those toe holes. This is part of tracking an elusive creature, trying to emulate its movements and its tracks. And in spite of the soft moss, I can't even come close to creating the depth in inches of the tracks I'm finding here. So, you know, you get out here, and the purpose is to interact with some phenomenon that certain individuals will say 
they've seen and exist. And you, you do whoops and rock clacking and tree knocking and look for tree breaks and structures and so on. And then you hear, <coughs> and something like that. And uh, way off in the distance, raven or Bigfoot. You can't know until you see it. Employing the various methods I've been taught while out researching Bigfoot, I continue on. Apparently, I don't know my own strength. When I was 100 or a couple hundred yards that way, it sounded like rocks being clacked together. It's not, it's a red squirrel. I got him confused. Do you see the different sounds that you hear? It might be a, a squirrel or a bird of some sort. And if you're far enough away and it echoes or it cuts through the trees, you end up uh, hearing something else, like rocks clacking. And Bigfoot, uh, let's call them enthusiasts, as a whole group, as a large group of individuals, have a bit of a conundrum. I mean, there's thousands of, of tracks that are held by experts to be the real deal unable to be, have been faked. There's thousands of sightings and anecdotal references of verbalizations and rock throwings and hooping and tree knocking and all that sort of stuff. It goes on and on. Yet popular culture and mass opinion doesn't accept any of that. So it's really quite a problem for the enthusiasts of this subject matter as a whole. Only time is gonna answer this question. And so it's time for me to hook back up with my special effects designers at Soda Productions to take my fake track making to the next level. Next stage. Good to see you. So, All right, talk to me. We got these, uh, we got them poured up. They've been sitting up for a couple of hours. So we're gonna pop these out of the mold to give you the feet. And you've attached them to drywall stilts to give you a parallelogram like a real step. These attach uh, onto, uh, onto here. They, wow. they telescope down. You can actually wear them and walk in them. And this is a urethane called Fast Flex, and that's a castable urethane, and it kind of feels like a tire when it's completely cured. Okay. Dermal skin ridges, movement of toes, and length of stride are all considered this time. And these track makers were actually modeled after Roy's own set of what are supposed to be real tracks cast in Washington years ago. It's time to take my hoaxing to the next level. I have the track makers. Now I need to make and subsequently cast with plaster my fake tracks. My current bill, by the way, is now approaching $10,000 in costs. And that's with Roy giving me a deal out of sheer interest. Hoaxing is indeed no simple matter. I have to show pictures of the measurements and pay attention to getting some quality castings. As good as I'm getting at doing this, I still blew it on the first few attempts, until finally I had my prize, albeit fake, track. But now comes the litmus test. Can I present all of this to Jeff Meldrum and John Bindernagel? two of the most knowledgeable people on the planet when it comes to Bigfoot tracks and biology, and have them spot the fake. Do these accredited professionals face controversy in their fields? You bet they do. But they remain undaunted, and with the amount of data they're aware of, there are no doubts in their minds of the creature's existence. Jeff and John are on the extreme left side of the scale, convinced that we are dealing with an upright walking ape, or perhaps Giganopithecus and their knowledge level of detail on everything from foot morphology, including skin dermal ridges, to hair DNA, is impressive, to say the least. Here was a, a hoax of the day. These are hoaxes? These are hoaxes. Wow. So, so here, you know, you can actually see the person has used their hand 
And in trying to impress the soil without excavating, what they do is they press in here, it causes the soil to hump up. And then here they're just using their fingers. I mean, these are so clearly finger mm -hmm. imprints. Yep. Just as it becomes easy for a wildlife biologist to know the difference between a black bear track and a grizzly bear track, many of the same field techniques are used to flesh out the fake Bigfoot tracks from the real ones. As Jeff points out, all of the various tracks, I get to see a piece of Sasquatch history. And what are these here? Uh, these are just some replicas. These are from the Patterson-Gimlin film site, actually. So this is uh, the tracks of Patty. These were cast by Roger Patterson. This is one of the two originals. Those are ex still excellent examples of uh, uh, presumably a female Sasquatch. To keep my ruse as real as possible, I've also brought along three other castings, which are supposedly real and actual Bigfoot tracks, including my own from Clem 2, British Columbia. I'm just sort of bringing them to you two gentlemen sure. and saying, OK, well, now let's, so now let's take a look at these. All ones. right. So these here were in the Clem 2 area out on Clem 2 Lake in the sand. They happened overnight while I was out there alone, hmm. and they were 40 yards apart. So looking at this, I, I would assume this is the track. And here is the here is the ball, and and the indication of the arch, and then big toe, and then the smaller lateral toes. It's actually very similar to a human, and of course the size. You're not ruling out a human by tremendous size mm -hmm. proportions. I wanted to argue about those casts because I was there, but for now, on to the sting. I looked at these striations here. Is that what you call dermal imaging? That could well be. Maybe some down here. It's pretty faint. Yeah, in fact, that's pretty good. The detail is actually pretty interesting. Um, the toe stems are quite visible. Uh, I was talking earlier about the significance of the breadth to length ratios, and, and that breadth is, is quite compelling. These teardrop-shaped toe pads mm -hmm. are very natural looking. I mean, it bears a striking resemblance here to, to this footprint. At first, and I believe it was out of courtesy and good manners for my benefit, I seemed to have them fooled. But then, giving in to his more scientific and critical thinking, Jeff notices something too coincidental to ignore. You know, and this, this is one thing that does sometimes give me pause. This is a, a very widely known trend. Yeah, true. The more I talk about these things, the, the easier it is for someone to get a hold of a copy like this. Mm -hmm and uses either as a pattern, either directly, or as a pattern to make a fabrication. This one, this one actually looks a lot like, like this track. Except it uh, seems to be a bit broader, and that could just be some of the deformation in the snow and the casting process after, but even that, that very distinctive teardrop to toe, which is quite similar to this example here. Teardrop toe. Would you say, yeah, this is suspect on any of these? Well, I I, or, I wouldn't place a lot of value on these, okay. quite honestly, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that's human. So I would, I would set those aside. Okay. These are very interesting to me, and I would want to look at them further to eliminate conclusively that possibility that, that a hoaxer was using <clears throat> some other source of inspiration to come up with a believable footprint. This guy here, that's exactly what this is. This is a fake based on this. Oh, for like someone who has that oh, kind of shot. Yeah. But you spotted it. Yeah. You know who made this? A Hollywood special effects guy with a passion for hoaxing. Well, that's sad. It's sad, but <laughs> watching you put these three tracks together going, these are really close. And I could see your brain scratching. You know, these are really close. <laughs> to me, I think points more to the credibility of you guys to be able to to actually pick this stuff out and, and decipher what is real from what's fake. One of the throwback debates is, oh, they're all hoaxes. And what I'm trying to say is, some may be, sure. but there are ways to very quickly and sometimes yep. to determine which ones are hoaxes. Sure. Cool. Um, so can we 3D and analyze this one? Sure, yeah. Just, just this one. Yeah. So did I fool the experts? Let's call it a tie. I played my hand pretty lightly after all. But to their credit, they weren't ready to say anything definitively. The sheer courage of Jeff and John to hold fast in their research is incredible. 
given the fact that Bigfoot still equals professional suicide. I'm quite certain they are hoping for the day of vindication, when scientifically they can stand back and say, we told you so. Leaving the fakes behind, we'll take one of the real tracks to the 3D lab where it can be scanned, because as the hoaxers become more sophisticated, so too do the track specialists. The two noted scientists, Jeff Meldrum and John Bindernagel, are decidedly on the left side of my Bigfoot scale, preferring to focus on the existence of an upright walking ape or hominid. But back in Western Canada, Randy and Sonia focus on connecting to another world altogether. And with their friend Zoe, I'm pushing Randy's limits of exploration. Going out at night, especially alone, is normally out of the question. But that's where I'm most comfortable. And so I return and ask Randy to head out late in the day into his known hotspots for Sasquatch interaction. This big structure here, all these logs, this goes back to about 2009, 2010, and the Bigfoot researcher in this area said he was here uh, on one day, and then uh, a couple of days later, it was put up. What's interesting about this particular structure is that the story that this researcher got many years ago from a native elder is that all these trees, the number of trees add up to the number of Bigfoot in this particular family Bigfoot. And then in fact, often these structures represent the birthing of a baby. So this is this traditional native lore that we're talking about now. So one, two, three, four, four trees, four logs, all tied in tight together like that, four members of the family, and obviously perhaps a fifth member was born. You would think in a forest with millions of trees that you would see hundreds and hundreds of examples of structures like that, but you don't. And often, you do see them built with trees that are right in the middle, that have been carried from somewhere else, that came from somewhere else, that do not have a root structure at the bottom. Perplexing. If Sasquatch is real, it can only have accomplished what it has against all odds every minute of every day by being far more controlled, more precise in its tactics than we are equipped to accept. So we're headed into a, a spot that uh, this group has had some serious contact before, rocks being thrown at them on the trail, that kind of thing. I'm going to lag behind and uh, try and follow their trajectory of walking up ahead of me. I just want to be back up from them just so I can have that kind of peace of being able to hear anything around me. for sure, for all researchers of any kind, type of phenomenon in the wilderness, nighttime is a whole different game. While using my thermal camera, I noticed something about 100 yards away watching us. In my opinion, it was likely a raccoon or a small bear, and it did disappear before I got a solid look at its form. accurate descriptive terms I've heard that may apply to Sasquatch, if they do indeed exist, is curiously afraid. Hear that? 
What did you hear, Randy? I hear something behind us. Yeah, know where we came behind from. Behind you, Zoe. Finally, after hours, we hear something I've only ever heard once before, many years ago. After years of experience in the bush, I have never heard a coyote or wolf sound like the howl we heard tonight. Here are three separate examples of actual coyote calls. And now, three wolf calls. scream in the night. Our whole purpose out here was to hike in the dark and work at eliciting an interaction with something other than wolves and coyotes. This sound will be argued about by many. How's it tense? Mm -hmm. You guys have heard coyotes as well, I mean. I've heard them all my life. Yeah. And that call? You know what that was? That was an imitation call. You think it was, a imitate, it was something imitating a coyote? Yeah, trying to. Yeah. I always hear them very high-pitched, very yippy, and usually many of them together. Now, OK, let me ask you a question. What would be the best way for us to react right now? I think uh, one of, one of uh, Randy's calls. Yeah? Be nice. say what it was, but I'm not ready to say coyote or wolf. Every creature, including ourselves, is bound by two factors, that which we do by instinct and that which we can be taught to do. So was it an instinctional cry of a known species of wildlife, or a learned method of communication from something as yet undiscovered by mainstream science? It was all we would hear this night, though we continued on in the dark. Now, whatever that screech was, that was strange. Tonight, the crew's all together in one spot, and I've chosen to come out a little, more, a little bit more isolated from them, 150 yards away or so, and just, uh, 
just so I could be out here on my own. And I'll let you know if anything happens. As I camp off on my own in Randy's hot spot for Sasquatch, I get a little more than I bargained for. So I got something outside the tent. It just woke me up. I was pushing around, moving around all over the tent. Probably a raccoon. And I can hear some big branches being broken far off. What I failed to mention here is that the pushing came from above, at least four feet up on the top of the tent. Long, slow, gentle pushes down. Not very raccoon-like at all. So whatever was right here, is gone, I think. But I mean, I, I literally woke up. It was light, it was just pushing all around on the tent, just pushing. This just doesn't make sense. They gotta wonder sometimes what I get myself into. Perhaps a Sasquatch's understanding of the world, of their world, is so entrenched, they have no need to build civilizations upon it, work with fire, or invent the wheel. Perhaps they found their way to exist separate and apart from us, and they're sticking to it, both instinctually and through a strong sense of self-preservation and violating that understanding would threaten the entire species with extinction should we humans master their ways. They would be then, in fact, if they exist, the greatest survivalists of all. Now that science is making new discoveries all the time about our own past, about Neanderthals and the recent Denisovans, it would seem we are barely scratching the surface, and each new study of ancient DNA brings a fresh angle of interpretation of a whole new player in the Sasquatch drama. Is Sasquatch an ape, an alien, a hybrid species able to control the as yet unknown laws of the universe? Or here's a mind bender for you. Is Sasquatch another species of human? Instead of composing symphonies, one that focused on methods of survival we are only beginning to understand, the answer is still out there.